the leaders of the school, famous school, Rune School, uh, and then I think professors and some guests, and then students. So usually I uh, prefer mention you as a human brothers and sisters. Uh, on the secondary level, there are differences. But the fundamental level, we are the same human being, just human brothers and sisters. Differences of nationality, difference of races, different of uh, religion, culture, these are secondary. So I usually uh, call you as a human brothers and sisters, and particularly young brothers, young sisters. <clears throat> Firstly, you invited me. Thank you very much. I had the opportunity to uh, visit here, Dahadun. 1959, uh, March, I left Lhasa. Uh, situation is very difficult. So things become out of my control. So in any way, then April 59, I reach Missouri. So one year, I stay in Missouri. Uh, and also there's a few occasions to visit here. That, uh, very nice place. Uh, so, at the beginning of uh, refugee life, immediately after sort of serious of course, difficulties, and I really enjoyed India's freedom. So, one year memory, stay in Missouri. Something. I had a very happy moment. Then, 1960, I shifted to Himachal, Dhamsala. Not out of my choice. <laughs> we very much prefer to remain here. <laughs> At that time, you see, the Dhamsala quite isolated. And nowadays, of course, much changed. At that time, in uh, early 60s, Dhamsala a little bit isolated. So, uh, we prefer to remain at our, uh, in Missouri. But however, Government of India, you see, they might stay here for temporary arrangement, then more long-term no. sort of settlement place, Government of India is choose Dhamsala. So there are also, uh, one advantage is just uh, behind our sort of uh, place, the snow mountain, very close. So, in any way, last 52 years, in a way, uh, refugee. With me, there are about 100,000 Tibetan refugee community in this country. Initially, naturally, a lot of difficulties, but eventually, with the help of Indian government, and also various, the government of various different states, where Tibetan settled. Very, very kind. And most important, local people. Of course, occasionally some problems. <laughs> yeah. That's quite understandable. But basically, overall, uh, they, with the local people, very good relation. So, uh, 
many my friends who uh, was involved some helping the Tibetan refugee community in the early 60s or 70s, they all say our oh, Tibetan refugee communities are one of the very, very successful refugee community. Then most important in education, the Pantan Nehru personally really showing genuine concern about proper education. That is what I can do. No need. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I am extremely happy to come this place with those sort of times, my sort of say, experience or memory. So I'm very happy. Then, after I came to India, what I learned, besides many other things, uh, one important thing is, India, thousand years, the concept of ahimsa. And with that, religious tolerance, also thousand years. So, I'm very much impressed. The concept of ahimsa, non-violence, and the concept of as a religious harmony. So then, eventually, uh, when I saw a different part of the world, too much violence. So, I really felt the India's tradition, practice of Ahimsa, is something not only ancient sort of tradition or concept, but also very relevant to this world. And then, religious harmony. Also, I have been Northern, Northern Ireland a few times. Among the people who follow Jesus Christ and reading a prayer, a prayer according to Bible, same people, but in the name of Catholics and Protestants, sometimes kidding each other. Then, of course, among the Muslim brothers and sisters, also with the name of Sunni and Shia, kidding. And these things, you see, so, and I really feel now the India's thousand-year-old tradition, Ahimsa, non-violence, and religious harmony, this must sort of, must sort of know more people. So wherever I go, uh, I tell him, I'm telling people, Ahimsa, or non-violence. Non-violence non does not mean you remain indifferently. Non-violence means you are very active among these problems or difficulties. But the way to solve or deal with this problem through strictly non-violent way, that's the human way. Use weapon, use force, particularly in our modern, sort of modern time. The destructive power is immense. Uh, so the human problem try to solve through use this destructive, what's it, uh, uh, weapons. It's inhuman. A lot of innocent people 
suffer. Women, children. So, the use of force is outdated. And also the, the today's reality, the global economy, not only nation to nation, but also continent to continent, heavily interdependent. So destruction of your neighbor is destruction of yourself. So that's the reality. So we have to find ways and means to solve this problem through human way. That's not violent as a method. So I always they say try to propagate the thousand year old interest tradition, non violence. And the non violence ultimately related with motivation. Yeah. Out of sincere motivation, compassion, sense of concern of others' well being, then verbal action, physical action, Sometimes maybe a little harsh, but because of the compassionate, motiv compassionate motivation, it is essentially non-violence. Out of sort of desire to cheat other people, to bully other people, to exploit other people, to take advantage on other weaker section of people, uh, and then nice words, uh, smile. It's actually a kind of violence. So therefore, the demarcation, violence and non-violence, ultimately related with motivation. Therefore, uh, uh, I always try to make clear warm-heartedness uh, is very important. Uh, I usually use, it, use the reason, three reasons. Firstly, our common experience, now perhaps here, I think over 2,000 people, maybe 1,000. We, everybody, come from our mother. So we grown up, mother's care. So as soon as we born, the child no idea who is that person. But biologically, totally relying on that person. The mother's side also, totally committed, taking care about the child. That's a biological factor. Not coming from religious faith. So that's our common experience. So the experience when we received at that time that experience, I think, re deeply ingrained in, in, in our blood. So, naturally, I think here, yeah, outwardly, some are very smart, <laughs> some are perhaps less. Uh, <laughs> I think a deep insight, those people who received maximum affection from our mother, I think in deep insight, much happier, calm. That those, those people who at that sort of time received lack of affection, right? and worst case, uh, uh, rejection. Uh, rejection, rejections, or abuse. I think, in spite of outward, very smart, but deep inside, some sense of insecurity. As a result, difficult to reach out to other people who received maximum affection at that time, and much easier to reach out to other people. So, so that is the uh, common experience. Then common sense. I think if you look carefully, your neighbors, 
that those neighbors, those family, uh, who really enjoy human affection in their family, no matter what sort of economic condition, they're full of joy on the basis of trust. Uh, that family, much happier. So those family may be very rich, even powerful, but within the family, remember, lack of trust, suspicion, jealousy. These brings distrust. Then that family may not be happy. So we can see these things. If you use common sense, we can see the value of warm-heartedness. And then, third, third point, now, according to modern medical science, for physical health, healthy mind is key factor. Constant fear, hatred, anger, actually eating our immune system. Calm mind, really helpful to sustain our healthy body. I think in that in that in that respect, uh, uh, I can show my. Uh, I I want to show my face. <laughs> now age, now. Uh, now uh, nearly 77 years old. Uh, but I'm quite healthy. I often used to tell him, uh, his uh, close friend, Dr. Chobi, very specialist about the Kazani, uh, jaundice, what would you call? Uh, uh, gallbladder, gallbladder. So, uh, unlike my previous visit here, now this time, same body, same person, but one important organ is missing. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Chopi, he, he suggests to me, uh, it is much, much safer to remove that, because at that time, about two, three years ago, at that time, my gallbladder, gallbladder uh, enlarged more than two times and pus inside. So then he really warned me, now time come, master remove. At the beginning, I was a little bit hesitant, but I want to look at his face, very sincere, since. Then I trust him, and I agree, yes. Now I will I will because of the, uh, go visit the that surgery. Uh, after his surgery, uh, all those surgery quite serious, but uh, within five days recover very rapidly. So so these are this is nothing special. My, uh, uh, Nothing special, but I think uh, my mental state is quite peaceful. I think that really makes differences. And Dr. Chobi, particularly his wife, <laughs> later told me uh, after her husband's sort of operation or medical sort of treatment about me, uh, her husband becoming much more calmer. <laughs> <laughs> so his wife, you see, one time you see, uh, came to see me and expressed that way. Perhaps that means before that, her, she gets some problems. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> oh, this is I think maybe secret. Maybe. <laughs> so. So, so the calm mind, peaceful mind, really 
makes your health good. Constant anger, uh, out of too much greed, too much ambitious way, or ambition, unrealistically, and too much worry, worry transformed anger, hatred. Very bad for our health. So then, see, warm-heartedness is something very useful for our life. All religious tradition talks the practice of love, compassion, with that practice of forgiveness, tolerance, and also contentment, self-discipline. Honesty, truthful, all miserable tradition carry this message. Why? All these religions are human religion. Some of these teaching great sort of masters, you see, taught us according human sort of condition. So therefore, all religion, all miserable tradition, you see, carry the same message. However, I always telling people, no matter one religion is a very sort of good one, very sort of popular, but no single religion cannot be universal. Thousand years, different religious tradition remain. In the future also will remain. So now the question, of the, the awareness, the ultimate source of peace, ultimate source of comfort is within ourselves. Uh, so this must educate people. So then uh, that sort of education also should be universal. So therefore, uh, I try to uh, make clear we need education warm, about warm heartedness through secular way. So many people uh, I say they support that, agree that. So wherever I go, I always say uh, make clear these values, not necessarily through religious belief, but without touching religious faith simply use our common sense, common experience, and scientific findings. And then second, my lifelong commitment is promotion of religious harmony. So I have uh, many friends in different, different religious sort of, uh, sorry, traditions, some Christians, uh, uh, one time in Australia, my pub, before my public talk, he introduced me. Actually, that person is one Christian minister. And while he introduced me, he described me as a good Christian. <laughs> uh, that I jokingly used to respond to him, I consider you as a good Buddhist. <laughs> in reality, yes, we both practice all these important of us today a practice. No differences. In the philosophical field, there's differences. But that's necessary for different people who have different mental disposition. We need different way of approach. So, different philosophy, come. But the purpose of these different philosophical sort of views, same purpose to strengthening these basic human values. So I just used to share uh, uh, people in general, particularly the student here. You are the generation who belongs to uh, the 21st century. My generation, I think not only me, <laughs> but these gentlemen, and here also, you see, I think many of you, we are the generation who belongs to the 20th century. 
So our century gone. So we also now ready to say bye bye. <laughs> so the you, those people whose age blow 30, 20, 15, you are real generation of this century. So look back, 20th century. Unfortunately, in spite of a lot of sort of, I should say, as an advancement in technology and scientific field, all these wonderful. In spite of that, that 20th century become century of violence. According to some historian, uh, dur during that century, over 200 millions of people killed. If such sort of immense violence really transform world, better world, then maybe some cause of the justification. But that is also not the case. So since the immense violence, including use nuclear weapon, failed to bring better world, peaceful world, compassionate world, so therefore, now, uh, we, you should try to create this world more peaceful. As I mentioned earlier, ultimate source of peace is within ourselves. So pay more attention while you are developing your brain. You must pay more attention about warm-heartedness. And those teachers also, you see, speak more. The education, knowledge alone may not bring individual inner peace as well as peace in the family or in the society. Education combined with warm-heartedness, sense of concern of well-being other, and sense of community, sense of responsibility. With that, and education go together, then your education, your knowledge become constructive. If the, or say the smart brain, full of knowledge, but negative emotion here, your education become destructive education. So therefore, you must pay more attention while you're learning new things. And also, you see, think more about warm heartedness, good heart. So that I want to, to share with you, so that you can uh, develop, you can make sh new shape of this world, more peaceful, true, more compassionate world. So that I want to tell you. Sometimes I jokingly is telling young student, please you see, uh, think more about that. And then peaceful world, compassionate world, my lifetime may not materialize. Uh, but there is a real possibility. Uh, this century, 21st century, only about 10, 11 years past, remaining still coming. So there is a real possibility to change this world, better world, including environment, more healthier, more uh, more sort of what is it, a healthier environment. Possible. Uh, so I may not see my generation, our generation may not see these things. But I sometimes I take I jokingly tell them I maybe after you see uh, 20 30 years I may be either in heaven or hell and I will watch you <laughs> these young people really sort of building nice world or too much mess away. mess away. mess, mess. <laughs> I will watch you. <laughs> So, please think 
a small sort of vision uh, with full of optimism. Logically, a lot of problem which we are facing is essentially man-made problem. So then logically, human beings also have the ability to reduce this man-made problem. Of course, nature disaster, these are something different. But here also, human behavior, a little sort of a contribution, according to the environmentalist, the specialist using these people. It's clearly sort of what they uh, mention these things. So therefore, uh, if we keep optimism and bigger sort of vision, and our method should be realistic method, then there is a real possibility to change this world. So that I wanted to share with you. And then, then some questions. Now I, I will sit there. Some questions. I have a question. Um, what are your views regarding control of anger and aggression? How can you control that? I think firstly, I myself also, when I was young, a very short temper. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, see, uh, getting more experience, then my mind uh, becoming much more calmer. So, here, yeah, uh, Firstly, I think you should realize the anger uh, may bring some kind of energy, a short moment, a short period. But that energy is actually blind energy. And anger really destroy your, how should the uh, part of your brain which can judge the uh, I'm right or wrong. So when we fully sort of develop anger, we can't see the reality. So that energy, more bold, right? Uh, but that energy is blind energy. Uh, so the, in order to face the problem, our method should be, as I mentioned earlier, realistic. In order to carry realistic method, you must know the reality. When we look the reality, when we investigate the reality, our mind should be calm. Otherwise, we cannot see the thing objectively. So, in order to use human intelligence properly, our mind should be calm. So thinking this line, anger, you see, firstly, destroy your inner peace. Secondly, destroy your ability to, to investigate the reality. So uh, you think this line, then once you have clear sort of awareness, anger is no use, only destruction. Then you yourself become a little bit sort of distance from anger. Usually our problem is we consider anger part of our mind, attachment part of our mind. So we consider these are something normal. Uh, according, I think, your tradition, India's tradition, a lot of explanation about the system of the mind or emotion, not only in Buddhism, but also in Hinduism. Or the tradition where practice of samadhi, practice of vipassana, there, there are a lot of explanation about mind, about emotion. So uh, it is important, you see, uh, uh, clear awareness. Some of the emotions are very, very destructive. Some of the emotions are very, very sort of uh, constructive. So make clear, some kind of clear map about emotion. That's important. Then, 
once we use our common sense more realistic way or through calm mind, then uh, things uh, quite sort of complicated, very complex. So once we saw that, the patients automatically come. If you look just one point, you want that uh, without seeing the uh, whole picture, then impatience develop. Once we saw things are not that easy, a lot of complex sort of situation, once we realize that holistic picture, then your way of approach also becoming more realistic. Then uh, this kind of impatience, or too much impatience and frustrations will reduce. Clear? Do you agree or disagree? <laughs> if you agree, then think more. <laughs> if you disagree, then I won't talk further. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Thank you. Kanishka Malik, please. Your Holiness, uh, my question is a political one. Uh, it's concerning China's actions in Tibet. Now, considering that over the last four or five years, more and more countries, especially Western countries, have become dependent on China for economic purposes. Do you still think that the West will show any considerable opposition to China's actions in Tibet? Of course, since uh, last March, now I handed over all my political said, authority or responsibility to hand it over to elected uh, political leadership. Although uh, 2001, we already achieved elected political leadership. Since then, my position is semi-retired position. Now this year, 10th March, now I handed over all my relation to authority and not only I retired uh, from the political sort of responsibility, but also, you see, almost four century old Tibetan tradition, Dalai Lama institution is head of both political power as well as spiritual. That I voluntarily, happily, proudly ended. So now we fully committed genuine democratic system. Uh, so I think your question's answer, I think best come from elected political leadership. <laughs> if you have opportunity to meet, to meet him. And now I'm speaking here, I'm answer or response to you as a ordinary Tibetan. Uh, firstly, you see, Tibetan issue is also issue of moral issue and issue for truth or justice. As a result, more and more Chinese, particularly inte intellectuals, writers, thinkers, artists, of course, besides Chinese Buddhist, more and more Chinese now really showing their concern and really showing their solidarity. So this is the really hopeful sign. Ultimately, Tibetan problem must solve between Chinese and Tibetan. Of course, outside world can influence, can pursue but real sort of solution must be found between Tibetan and Chinese. So the support from the Chinese community is very essential. Now say, last two years, we noticed about 1,000 articles in Chinese language wrote by Chinese. All 1,000 articles fully support about our middle wave approach. Very much critical critical view about the Chinese government policy. So these are really hopeful signs. The other hand, you see Tibetan, 
spirit inside Tibet. Now, 60 years passed. The three, four generations now, Kazuta, are passed. But Tibetan spirit, even stronger, stronger, stronger. Like that. Uh, and then China, China itself, uh, last 60 years, I usually usually describe uh, the China, uh, last 60 years of China, four eras. eras well. Mao Zedong's era, which very much emphasizes ideology. Uh, then, uh, Deng Xiaoping era, don't care about ideology, more important is money. <laughs> People should become more rich. So in order to become so that richer, uh, the, the uh, Deng Xiaoping even sort of also the sacrifice the pure socialist sort of system. <laughs> so now today, uh, many people consider China no longer as a socialist country, but capitalist authoritarian country, like that. The communist ideology, Marxist ideology, now gone. <coughs> Uh, so, this Chinese communist is capitalist communist, quite strange. So, big change. And now then, Jiang Zemin era. Uh, Jiang Zemin uh, saw the new reality, the, 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 beside working class people, the middle class people, and billionaire or millionaire, these also become very influential in the society. So Communist Party, no longer party of the working class people. So his idea, the three represents, all classes represent by Communist Party, like that. Then Wu Jintao era, it's a new system, new sort of policy, now also create uh, like rich and poor, and certain rights which working class people enjoy many decades. Now, these also now becoming difficult. So, uh, he emphasis uh, promoting or develop a harmonious society. Although I think 10 years passed, more or less fail <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that, that goal. <laughs> more problems, more divisions now <laughs> in China. So, there are a lot of problems. So, the People's China, I mean, because of the, uh, the People's Republic of China, actually much changed. Uh, I took Tibetan sort of responsibility, political responsibility, uh, in 1951. So, now, 2011. Much changed. When I was in Peking, 1954 and 55, I received sort of a lot of sort of uh, lectures, including Chairman Moore himself. So I very much attracted about Marxism. So since then, as far as uh, socio-economy theory is concerned, I still Marxist. But meantime, I totally against the authoritarian system. Many European communists, many European sort of Marxist, the same view as far as socio-economic theory, the Marxist, they believe Marxism. But from Lenin, too much emphasis on power, ruthless, and create whole state like state of police state. Now today on China, uh, recently, is I met some, you see, uh, Taiwanese, uh, my friend. Nowadays, there's a lot of tourists from China coming to Taiwan, and also some businessmen uh, making business. So I asked my uh, Taiwanese friend, what kind of impression those Chinese who come from mainland China? Uh, and then that, uh, Taiwanese told me, uh, some of these Chinese who come from mainland China, after they spend a longer, longer period in Taiwan, then they express, now in here, they mean, I mean, that means 
in Taiwan. Here, uh, no atmosphere of fear. In mainland China, everywhere fear. So, the, uh, the political system, as Chinese prime minister, many occasions publicly express that China needs political change, political reform. And even one, one case, he mentioned that China really need, need Western style of democracy. That person, not just ordinary sort of, uh, sort of, uh, intellectuals, uh, he, prime minister, he expressed that way. So therefore, things are changing. We are not seeking independence, uh, separate from China. Uh, for our own interest, as far as economic development is concerned, we depend also, you see, very much want more economic development. For that reason, remain within the People's Republic of China. Uh, uh, we, uh, it is our own interest for development, provided they should, provide, they should give us meaningful autonomy so that we can preserve our own cult unique culture, unique language, and rich Buddhist tradition. And we can take sort of full care about environment. So then there is mutual benefit, like that. So many Chinese, uh, that way of approach, fully support. So, uh, and then West, in spite of that sort of little sort of they hesitant. They, from time to time, they always raise human rights issue, racial freedom, Particularly, they mention about Tibet. It's quite encouraging. Like that. Thank you, Your Holiness. Uh, the question, Your Holiness, is hmm? do you support the way of protest put forward by Anna Hazare? The style of protest. Some people, little sort of the reservation, the way handling. But, you see, uh, the objective of that movement is, you see, they uh, reminds Indian people, including Indian government, Indian politicians, the corruption is very, very serious. Uh, that, I think, very right. Uh, I also, you see, often, you see, expressing now the corruption. Uh, some other countries, like China, <laughs> No religious faith, <laughs> those corrupted people. They don't care about moral principle, about God. It's understandable. Only money or power. India. I think those corrupted people, I think one way in their home, I think statue of uh, uh, Shivaji or Ganesh uh, is there. Must be there. So every morning, worship. So a person who believes God, then their practice don't care about God's sort of wish. It's really a contradiction. Uh, so the other day, the Gandhi's birthday, the 2nd October, uh, someone is asked me, about you see, that, that special day, uh, I, I told him, I, I responded, now, Gandhiji, everywhere in India, and not only India, but some other places also, now very much sort of showing respect. If you truly respect and love Gandhiji, then you must practice, you must implement Gandhiji's sort of concept. Then uh, Gandhiji very much emphasized importance of non-violence. So, ec so economy field corruption is also a form of violence. If you truly believe non-violence, you must stop these sort of uh, wrongdoing. And then furthermore, in this country, according to some people, 
the amount of money which sort of kasota which 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 god which created by corruption that amount of money spent on this, within the country the poorer section of peoples had education in these fields some significant sort of today a change some say that if that's the truth then really this corruption really for national interest not only image but in practical level very very harmful so i usually telling uh, these days this only or the two choice either believe god and believe karma and be should be sincere honest truthful or deny god and make a lot of money including corruptions only two choice believe half believe god half don't care about justice or honesty these things a lot of so making a lot of money through corruptions it's uh, i mean it's logical it's logical so that's my view so you younger generation uh it is easy to criticize other people but the thing which you are pointing out criticize that you must be you yourself must be pure honest truthful that's very important clear i think at this moment you have no opportunity to uh, to use some corruptions <laughs> when you get some jobs and your position little bit sort of has a higher and higher then the now today sort of some kind of cancer of the world that's corruption eventually you might get that sort of disease so you must be very cautious right? must be hold that determined i will never sort of involve corruptions uh, so sometimes uh, i sort of uh, so the, i jokingly you say expressing uh, communist author not only communist but other authoritarian sort of system uh, these people are great master of art of hypocrisy <laughs> said that i met some chinese from mainland china uh, very nice person i often nowadays is i often you see meeting chinese from mainland china some are very very religious minded some are uh, uh, really you see this sick truth so so i told them i spent 9 years with chinese communist forces from 1950 to, uh, 51 to uh, uh, 59 so i also uh, get some education how to act hypocrisy <laughs> and then as i mentioned earlier in 1959 april i reached india i truly liberated from practice of hypocrisy <laughs> now this country very open uh, really is a wonderful so meantime as i mentioned earlier i think uh, if you if you carry some wrong doing then this hypocrisy telling lie automatically involve then that person not genuine follower of mahatma gandhi ji all those indian great leaders particularly 1956 when i came india including dehradun at that time 1956 are they truly follower of gandhi ji freedom fighter they are cloth very poor uh, they speak truthful fearlessly that kind of spirit uh, after india get now because the nearly 70 years still you need gandhi and freedom fighter sort of spirit truthful honest fearless selfishness that's very very important although i think uh, recent sort of 
world economic crisis happened, India, quite stable, wonderful. Now still, you see, India, the most populated democratic country. So India must succeed. So depend on Indian people. Of course, leaders also very important. Ultimately, India belongs to Indian people, not this party or that party. When I was in recently, I was in America. I express America belongs to about 300 million Americans, not Republicans, not Democratic Party, as well as China. People's Republic of China belongs to 1.3 billion Chinese people, not party. So, so that's actually that's the main reason. I also believe Tibet belongs to Tibetan people. So they govern people by people themselves. The best way is democratic system. Elect by the people, freely. Then that rule the country. And always accountable uh, to people. And the people when majority of the people lose faith, then through election change. That's a very good system. So India, I think, compare with neighboring states, I think last now nearly 70 years, I think very, very stable country, very successful. In spite a lot of sort of or the drawbacks, India basically democracy deeply rooted and religious harmony, also very good, overall picture. Some pockets here and there, some problems. That's so quite understandable. So please think, Bharat, up to now, quite successful. Now you have great potential. Further, so, so that, uh, because of the success, and make example, a model of the rest of the world about nonviolence about religious harmony and democracy. Good, next. Thank you, Your Honor. Looking at where the world okay. is going, where in a, living in a society where working for the society before working for the self is easier said than done. In a place where love and peace are just two utopian worlds, a, how do you feel our generation is not going to make the same mix mistakes that the generation above us has? Self-centered attitude is actually due to short-sightedness. Long run, human being, social animal, one individual's interest for long run entirely depend on the community. So, too much self-centered, selfish sort of thinking is short-sighted. So, the, the, we must use human intelligence properly. As I mentioned before. Uh, so, the, uh, of course, uh, altruism, taking care about others' well-being, does not mean you forget your own interest. For your own interest, uh, the best way to fulfill your own interest is taking care of others, that you get maximum benefit. If you forget interest of the rest of the people, think only you yourself, and even your own family. If one, someone could just think yourself, and exploit as much as possible within the family member, how can your family be a happy family? That's, that's a fact. So the uh, selfish, uh, self-interest way is narrow-minded due to lack of knowledge about the reality. That's my view. And deep respects and love, and thank you for coming. May I say, please come back. <laughs>